Good morning. I don't know. Test one, seven, five. Okay, there we go. Good morning. Good to see you here today. Hope you'll take just a moment and register your attendance. Uh, there are registration pads on the aisle end of each pew. If you'll take just a moment to fill those out or text the number on the screen and respond to the text that comes to you. Uh, there are several announcements in your bulletin and would like to lift up some of those. Uh, United Women in Faith have a special program on Wednesday at 10 a.m. and want to encourage as many people to come and be a part of that. Uh, Lisa Michelle Schaefer will be their special guest speaker and will be uh, talking about a, a program called Think Pink. And uh, if you're not familiar with her, then just ask somebody. They all, all seem to know who she is. Um, Hymn Sing for the Ages and Covered Dish Supper is coming up on the 21st. want to uh, encourage you to come and be a part of, of that Hymn Sing Bring something to eat and share. Uh, I always tell people bring pecan pie because we never have enough. So just, if we, all we have is pecan pie, that will be enough. So it's okay. Um, we are attempting to do a hymn sing for all ages. And that means we'll be singing some things that are from the 17th century and the 1800s and the 1930s and the 2000s. Okay, and so we're looking at a wide variety of music for that, uh, that night and encourage you to come and be a part of that. A nursery is provided for children under four. And just to say a word, we have a great nursery. Uh, it's staffed by some enthusiastic folks and it is available to families uh, for children four and under uh, to make use of. And as I put it, this is so that moms and dads can be comfortable we are comfortable with your children in worship. We are glad to have the sounds of children in worship. But if it makes you more comfortable, uh, we have a nursery for your benefit, not necessarily for theirs. So there you go. Um, finally, want to let you uh, know about an opportunity to help with the preschool. Preschool ministries uh, have uh, several big events during the year. One of those is a family brunch. And the family brunch is coming up, and they're looking for people to help with the brunch items. A full description of that is on the back of your bulletin. The purpose of Chapelwood United Methodist Church is to make Christ-centered connections with others. We do that when we worship together, when we pray for one another, when we study together, when we serve with one another. We ask you at this time to stand and greet one another in the name of Christ Jesus.
There you go. There you go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Now that you have found your seat, good morning. Now that you have found your seat, please stand up. And we got call to worship first. Or is it song first? Oops, call to worship. I'm wrong. Good morning. My name is Darlene Sargent. Please join me in the call to worship. We are called to be God's children. God love has poured on us through Jesus Christ. Fear and doubt are gone. Joy and celebration ring in our hearts. Let us raise our voices in song. We offer our hearts to God in prayer and praise. Amen. Sweet, sweet spirit. Because he lives. Sweet to 
had a visitor. Down to the river to pray. Young at heart to come forward for children's time. What's that about? I don't know. Good morning. How are you today? Wow. Good, 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 good. Hi. Wow. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? All right. So, you know what this is? It's a lantern. It's what I use when I go camping. Yeah, it's a lamp. I don't go camping very much because it's not very dirty, but it's a lantern. This is something I never thought I'd ask the people in the booth to do, but could you turn off the lights? They don't know how to turn them off, just on. Woo. Are you scared? No. Not really. But you know, when, when I would go camping, a lot of times what we would do is we would have a fire, and it would be dark. And when we were in the dark and there was a fire, you know what? Some people would like to tell scary stories. Did you ever tell scary stories in the dark? Probably not a good idea. But, you know, what we would do is we'd get everybody so scared that we had to turn on the lantern, right? Because the light made us feel better. Now, I got to tell you that if you're out in New Mexico and there are bears, they're not scared of a lantern. But at least you'll see them before they eat you. And even if you turn it up on a high beam, it's still like they're still coming because they want the food. But they don't want you. They're just after food. So sometimes when we're scared, we just need to turn on the light. In the story we're going to share today from the Gospel of Luke, some people are talking about Jesus. And they know that Jesus has already been crucified and put in the tomb. But they keep seeing him. And you know what? People were scared. Because they're not supposed to see him anymore and they're afraid. And that fear just keeps coming up on them. They don't want to go outside, so they all get together and they're afraid. Just like that. 
they're hiding, right? But you know what happens? Jesus comes and appears to them, and it's like a light goes off. When they see him, not when they hear the stories about him, but when they see him, it's like the light comes on, and that fear becomes hope. What they used to be afraid of now gives them hope. I used to be afraid of the dark, and I still am. But the light in the dark gives me hope. So I want you to remember that when you're camping or when you're just at home or when you have that night light on, the light in the darkness reminds us of Jesus, and the light in the darkness gives us hope. Let's have a prayer, and we'll go back to our seat. Can you do praying hands and eyes with me? Dear God... Help us not to be afraid. Help us to see you. To remember you. And to have hope. Send us into your world. To share your love. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Wow, big love.
Good morning. My name's Ty Williams. I'm going to read the scripture this morning. From Luke 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I do. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms will be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. You are witnesses to these things. Hmm. You've seen a lot, haven't you? In the last couple of weeks, we've been basically in the gospel celebrating Easter again and again and again. Last couple of weeks, we have been reading from passages in the gospel that occurred on Easter or thereabouts or referred to Easter. And that resurrection day deserves more than just one week. It does. You are witnesses to these things. And how does being a witness to the resurrection of Jesus from the grave affect you And how does it bring you into new life? Scares me to death. Really. Think about it. It scared the disciples. When they went to the tomb and they found it empty and they encountered Jesus resurrected on their way out, they were terrified. And they said nothing to anyone. They just went home. And then they discussed it with each other and they scared the other disciples who didn't go to the cemetery. Can you imagine? Think about it for a moment. On our side, from our vantage point, we look back in time and we say, oh, I wish I was there. It would have been fantastic. I would have believed instantaneously because it has convinced me completely. But we're looking back through the witness of the church for all 2,000 years. We're looking back through the witness of the church and everything that we know and have been conditioned to believe. And yet that encounter that people had with the resurrected Jesus affected them differently. The women went to the tomb. They found it empty. They were grieved. They were sorry. They were a little bit angry that someone had taken his body away. When they encountered the risen Christ, they worshiped him, they begged him, they pleaded with him, and then they went home. They told the disciples eventually, the disciples, a couple of them ran down, they looked, and they didn't know what to make of it. These things don't happen. These things don't happen. It's not normal. People die. People are buried. They stay there. But not Jesus. And when he does the unthinkable, it challenges people to their very core. It frightens people to their very core. It is unexplainable. And they don't know what to do. They gather together, the disciples do. They cloister themselves away and they discuss what they have experienced and they say to each other, 
I went to the tomb. I saw these things. You, you, you know what I saw? They're trying to convince themselves of what they saw. Two of those disciples, they've had enough. They head out for Emmaus. They're walking along the side of the road. Jesus joins them. They do not recognize him. He is a wise person. He understands everything about the scripture. He explains to them what's going on in their very midst. And they don't really realize it's Jesus until they sit down to eat a meal and when he breaks the bread, when he assumes the role of host, they realize who he is. They look at each other and they say, wow, it's Jesus. And he vanishes from their sight. And they go back to Jerusalem to share that information with the 12 and with Peter. They are convinced And yet when they get there, they're having this discussion. And in the midst of this discussion about what has happened and what Peter saw and what John saw and what the women have reported and what they themselves have experienced, there are people who are frightened and do not believe and are still doubting. They're not able to convince their best friends. At that point, Jesus stands among them. How y'all doing? Boy, it's a good thing they did not have those uh, AEDs because they would have all been used that day. They would have all had to be resuscitated. But Jesus is there. He says, they think he's a ghost. They're afraid. They don't know how to respond And what Jesus does is absolutely amazing. Remember, this is Jesus resurrected from the dead. Jesus whom God has given authority over all things in earth and in heaven and everywhere and anywhere for all time. And what Jesus does is says the most normal thing anybody could ever say. I'm hungry. You got something to eat? Normal. You got something to eat. I'm flesh and blood just like you. You've touched me. You've seen me. Give me something to eat. I'm hungry. The Savior of the universe could have demonstrated anything that he wanted to demonstrate. He could have convinced them in any other way. And yet what he says is, I really could use a piece of fish right now. And they give it to him and he eats. Wow. Jesus comes back into their ordinary, everyday lives in a way that they cannot deny it is he who stands in their midst. It's not a ghost. It's not a specter. It's not a God pretending to be human. It's their friend resurrected from the dead. And in that moment, still some doubted, but they come to believe. I take great comfort in the fact that even though I was not there, there were people who were there who weren't completely convinced in the moment, but they came to believe later. And that gives me hope that those people who are not convinced at the moment will come to believe as they continue to encounter Jesus resurrected and as a part of their everyday life, as a part of who they are. How is it that we become the people of God believing in this resurrection? How is it that we who live these thousands of years later can claim and be a part of those events that happened at Golgotha and in the garden where his grave was and in the room in the city where the disciples gathered and on the road to Emmaus where they were trying to escape and back with them again every step along the way. 
How is it that we, 2,000 years later, simply by hearing the story and encountering the risen Christ, can be made different and new? It's the Apostle Paul that writes to us. He helps us to understand how that happens. He says, those who believe in Christ Jesus, crucified, dead, and resurrected, those who believe these things become a new creation. Those who believe this Jesus no longer are living as they used to live, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that comes within them, they are transformed into a new human being. No longer living by the whims of the flesh, no longer controlled by the animal instincts that we have to dominate and to uh, sin, but now controlled by the Spirit of God that is at work within you. You are made a new creature by believing in the one who has the power to make you a new creature. We are purified by the presence of the Holy Spirit, brought into a new and right relationship with our God. It's not always fun, though, is it? You ever been purified? You ever get purified by a preacher preaching a revivalist sermon? Boy, that's not any fun. I was preaching one Sunday morning, and old Mr. Dickens, he says, Oh, me. I thought, I don't know what's wrong with him. He must have had something wrong. I don't know, something's spring came up in his pew or something. I don't know. But I'd preach a little bit more, and he'd go, Oh, me. I He's not usually one of these call and response kind of guys. He's kind of just your average Methodist that doesn't speak unless it's in the bulletin, you know? <laughs> and we went on with the sermon, and he went, oh, me again. And finally on the way out, after it was all over, I said, what's, what's the matter? I said, well, did you need some help or, you know, what's going on? He says, no, you were just hurting me spiritually. I said, I was hurting you? He said, well, not really hurting me. You were just calling me to account in a way that caused me pain. And I thought, oh, not sure I'm supposed. Well, wait a minute. I am supposed to do that. <laughs> That's kind of my job. That's kind of what the scriptures call us to do. Not to intentionally inflict pain on people, but to speak the truth in such a way that people are convicted by the Holy Spirit so that they know where they are to grow, if that makes sense. It is part of the witness of the church, not just the witness of the preacher, but the witness of the community to bear witness to the love of God in such a way that sometimes the growth that is called for might not be the most enjoyable growth that we experience. But it's growth that is necessary for us to be transformed into the people of God. God works in and through the witness of the Scripture, in and through the witness of the faithful, to bring about change in our lives. And sometimes that change that is brought about is something that causes us fear. And sometimes that change that is brought about is something that causes us joy. But always that change that is brought about brings us closer to God. The question for us, dear friends, is are we willing to experience those moments of uncertainty and fear? Are we willing to experience those moments 
when we're not really sure what we're sure about to allow God to convince us? Are we really willing to allow God to transform us? You know, when I was younger, I had a lot more doubts about this, and I still am older, and I have several doubts about this because I kind of know who I am. You know who you are. I know who I am. Let's just leave it at that. And that's the way I like my relationships. I don't like you changing me. I don't want to change you. You don't change me. We're good. But the relationship we have with God's a little bit different. It is a relationship where he can't let us continue to be sinful. He can't let us continue to be a disappointment to ourselves. He can't let us continue to be those people who are shallow, for lack of a better word. God requires us. God transforms us into faithful, useful people. It's by that relationship, that encounter with the Holy Spirit, by that encounter with the Scripture, by that encounter with the witness of the church, by that encounter with God's Son resurrected, that we become a new creation a changed person, a person who is on their way to be in the presence of God. Wouldn't it be great if the gospel ended with these words? And they saw the empty tomb and they all believed and they built great worship halls and filled them with great songs and great music. Wouldn't it be great if that's the way it worked? So much easier. But God doesn't just want us to do that. God wants us to be changed. God wants us to be made new. God wants us to be made right. God wants us all for himself because God loves you that much. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we prepare to present to God our gifts, our tithes, and offerings. As we do so, I remind you that some of us give electronically, some of us give by text to the number on the screen, some of us place our offering in the plate. All of us give in response to God's grace at work in our lives. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for this day, for this time, for this place, for the witness of the people who sit around us, for the calling that you have given us. We pray that this response to your grace at work in our lives will be used to do the work of your church and this community and far beyond. Amen.
Please be seated. We come now to the time of celebrations and concerns, and there's a celebration uh, in your bulletin. It's a picture of our choir on Good Friday, and um, they're just an amazing bunch of folks. That's all there's to it. And we celebrate their ministry among us, and I'd like for them to stand up where they are and be recognized at this time. They add so much to our worship and our, our experience each week, and we are, are grateful for their witness. And we say together, praise be to God. Praise be to God. I'd like to celebrate the arrival of our family granddaughter, Abigail Elena Spears. Abigail Elena Spears, uh, first granddaughter, which is the one that counts, the granddaughter. <laughs> And we celebrate that together saying, praise be to God. Praise be to God. We celebrated uh, Dina's 16th birthday on Friday. Celebrated Dina's 16th birthday on Friday. There are other birthdays. For all those birthdays we celebrate, we say together, praise be to God. Do you enjoy when you come to the church the flowers out in the front entryway? Yes. And did you notice that there are new beds around some trees and in the front of room 402? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Perry, stand up. This is Perry, and he, well, I, I guess he is the boss of all that. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yesterday there was a work day and he uh, employed several other people uh, doing that work. I myself am not a gardener type person. I don't enjoy doing that, but other people love doing that. And other folks joined him and had a work day. And for all of their work and all of their efforts that uh, we all enjoy, we say praise be to God. Praise be to God. Are there other celebrations we'd like to share? The lights are fixed. They were here all week. They fixed the lights, replaced every bulb in here that they could reach. There's a couple of them they couldn't reach. Um, we changed the bulbs in the projector, but we've got to talk to the projector company about resetting something. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but everything uh, should be functional. Hopefully next week we'll, we'll be fully functional and ready to go. But for the uh, two young men who were way up there on a crane arm, uh, and for all that they did to help us to do that, we say thanks be to God. Thanks we also use this as an opportunity for you to share your concerns, and you need to do that by putting it on a per concern card, and you can return that to us as we exit the building today. But if you want it to be in the bulletin or included in our email. But today, as we worship together, you just say that concern out loud, and the congregation responds with, Lord, hear our prayer. 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 For those uh, caught up in the violence of war, Lord, hear our prayer. For those in Israel who live in fear, Lord, hear our prayer. For our military who do the work that we find unimaginable, Lord, hear our prayer.
Oh, gracious God, we come to you this day in prayer, lifting up the concerns of our heart, lifting up those that we know and are dear to us, praying for the world around us. We pray for peace, dear God. We ask for you to make your presence known throughout the world. We ask that you would work through all the resources that are offered. We ask that you would bring about a lasting peace that gives comfort and strength and security to all. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be faithful in the things we think, say, and do as we encounter others on your behalf. Allow us to be honest witnesses of your love and your grace. Allow us to be those instruments of goodwill in your world. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, who teaches us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The service of worship leads to acts of dedication. And if this is the day that the Spirit has been at work in your life and you want to make a response to that, we invite you to come forward and take the vows of membership and become a member of the congregation. Every disciple is called to do a next step. And this week, a thousand pounds of rice will be delivered and put in that hallway down there by the library. And somewhere over a thousand Ziploc bags will be delivered with that. And it is our hope and joy that you will commit to being part of a bulk rice packaging program to package that rice into smaller, more manageable packages that can be given out at the food basket. Uh, we'll need you to show up early and we'll need you to stay late next Sunday if you can be a part of that as your next step. And if you want, there's probably other ways that you can be a part of that if you'll get with um, Steve Miller, that Steve Miller over there. Uh, he'll probably get you in line as to some things you might be able to do during the week to get prepared for that event. Now if we'll stand, we'll sing our closing hymn together. What you standing around for?
That's what Jesus says at the beginning of the book of Acts. What are you standing around for? You are my witnesses here in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the ends of the earth. Go and bear witness. Go and share the love. Go and be the church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.